live in an age where every corner you turn, there's someone waiting in the shadows. Whisper lips or a switchblade dick. Where lies and manipulation are the dueling blades of the day. And you're looking to set yourself free? We'll keep walking right off the edge of that cliff. Because these are tales from the bottom down. If you are here, well, there's no excuses because you signed up to it. So you sit down, shut the fuck up, smoke them if you got them, and enjoy or not. Because you are entering a no-go zone. And I'm not talking about my asshole. I'm talking about tales from the bottom down. I'm Dead Bug, and I'm here with my boy, Jack Luna. Jack, you know, good son of a bitch. Are you there? I'm here. I'm glad. Smoke them if you got them. I'm going to smoke them because I got them. How you doing, Deadbug? I'm alive. And I guess that's something. Mm-hmm. Now, first of all, let me take care of a little business, Jack. If you're listening to this podcast over on YouTube, there's a complimentary podcast that you would usually find on Patreon. Patreon's a subscription-based service that for as low as a buck, you get this and much more. Now, think about it. What can you get these days for a buck? I mean, you can't even get a hooker in Bangladesh for a buck. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could, but uh, she'd have no legs, and she'd probably have flipper arms and be riding around on her skateboard and, and give you a nasty rash. And I mean, <laughs> that's the one thing we won't give you is a nasty rash. Right, Jack? Yeah. I'll leave a link in the description for you. No commitment. Now, Jack, I just want to jump into this episode. None of that usual small talk, a chitty chat. Yeah, I prefer it. Me too. You ever cry, Jack? You ever, you ever squirt out a few? You ever menstruate from your eyeballs? Like one of those pretty ladies that you left standing at the proverbial altar of regret, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> I try not to. You know, I really do. I, uh, I try to push it down, but there are times when it, when it, when it uh, hits me. So yes, to answer your question simply, yes. And I really don't have a problem with crying if I really feel it. Um, but I, I really do try my best not to and, and uh, hold it together, especially if there are people around. Well, yeah, because you don't want to be perceived as a sissy. There's a certain level of sissiness that is accepted within our society. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that, because, yeah, I, I was holding back a bit there. I cry all the time, dead bug. I was crying before we started here. Okay, Jack, uh, I think you've, you've said enough. Oh, okay. We'll move on from this subject, I think. I thought it was a safe place. Oh, okay. It's not that safe, Jack. No. (laughs) Why don't you stop before you lose any more of your uh, dignity? (laughs) But now that you've got all confessional with us, Jack, and compromised yourself, I'm going to do you one solid, and I'm going to tell you a story. Oh, wow. I'm going to expose my gentle side, my more feminine side, to you, Jack. Yeah. And yeah, sure, I might be risking ridicule and kickback from our listeners, but I'm willing to take that chance, Jack. Because, Jack, if I'm being honest here, and honesty is the best policy, the closest I get to being feminine is sitting down to take a piss. <laughs> that's very feminine, man. But that's where I draw the line. Now, Jack, I'm going to take you back to a long time ago. Mm-hmm. A time when my great passion was roller skating. <laughs> I, I'm serious, Jack. It was a healthy pursuit, lacing up and hitting the concrete. <laughs> and besides that, I was good, Jack. Maybe even the best. Mm -hmm. And I had the whole outfit as well. Everything. The skin-tight purple spandex pants. (laughs) I had those fluorescent yellow leg warmers that came up to my knees. No way. Jack, I was the real deal. A person committed to the art of roller skating. (laughs) Baby blue roller skates with white lightning bolts on each side. And I even had pom-poms on them. (laughs) <laughs> and I know what you're thinking, Jack. Gay. But these pom-poms were skulls knitted by my grandmother from my dead grandfather's sweater. Wow. And in That's some smart. ways, Jack, believe it or not, this was almost like a superpower. And I will go out on those streets. And I would fucking weave in and out of the cars. I could go down on one leg and stick the other leg out. <laughs> roll under trucks while they were driving. Hold on to the back of buses. 
I was Jack. I was the goddamn Magic Johnson, a roller skating Jack. I mean, no, except I wore black. Or had A's. Well, yeah, that as well. But if I did have it, I wouldn't tell you, because it's not relevant to the story. <laughs> but either way, I hope you wouldn't have held it against me. No, no. <laughs> a little bit. I'm trying to tell a fucking serious story, Jack. Will you wise up here for the fuck's sakes and just sit down and listen like you promised? Let's fucking let the leg out front, though. <laughs> the leg out front while you're, while you're skating down the streets a bit much. Like with the, with the fingerless leather gloves, high five and fucking dudes mm -hmm. when you're going down the street. Mm -hmm. But dude, in all seriousness, I did have a pair of the fingerless gloves. <laughs> it's almost like you got a crystal ball, Jack, and you're looking into my life. <laughs> it's incredible. Well, but in, in all seriousness, Jack, they do protect you, uh, you know, from scuffing your hand. Uh, I fail to see what's humorous in this. Right, yeah, you can drag your hand along the... Jack, is safety a joke to you? You're turning my emotional story into a story of ridicule. Uh, but I'm going to give you this one because God knows I've given you a hard time in the past, so maybe I deserve yeah, it. All right, a well, good sport. So I was out roller booting one day. That's slang for people who are cool. On the mean streets of Mississauga, Jack. Yeah. And it was then I came across my arch rival. My arch rival in roller skating, Jack. A real swinging dick, Jack. Mm -hmm. And his name was Azard Omar Dean. <laughs> Sounds like Mississauga. Don't judge, Jack. But yeah, he was this Pakistani kid, and he had this big afro. Mm. Now, when I used to call him a Pakistani kid, <laughs> I short-formed it. <laughs> it was a long time ago, Jack, the vernacular of the era. And he would protest this, and he'd tell me he wasn't Pakistani, he was from Trinidad. But I would just raise my fist and tell him to shut the fuck up, and then that would be the end of the topic. So we were out there doing our thing, like sex machines, out in the streets racing, trying to outdo each other with our stunts. So we were going between the cars, we were doing our disco moves, you know, when mm. you do those sort of shit, crisscrossing your legs and whatnot. Mm. We were jumping park benches, doing these very synchronized spinning moves around the park and pylons. Wow. Once, once, <laughs> once in a while you'd collaborate and grab hands and you'd swing your head. Well, most definitely. It wasn't always a competition against each other. Sometimes we would work together in unison and do these synchronized dances. <laughs> moves where I will pull him through my legs, lift him above my shoulders, or vice yeah, versa. Yeah. It was a sight to behold. <laughs> and on one such day when we were doing this, Jack, working on a very complex maneuver, and a large crowd had gathered and were cheering. A car mounts the sidewalk, Jack, and bumps into me and knocks me the fuck over. It skids oh, up. Oh God. And I'm laying there, Jack. Uh, Man. My spandex is ripped. There's blood everywhere. I'm dazed because I was in the middle of a trek. And out of this 1973 black Chevy steps my father, Jack. Oh, no. And he's looking down at me in disgust. And you know what he said to me? <laughs> Why are you hanging with that Stanny kid? Jack, that's inappropriate. What he said was, my son is goddamn Liberace. That's what he said, Jack. Liberace. And he fucking picked me up by my fucking jacket, and he threw me in the fucking car, and he drove me home, Jack. He drove me home, he went straight into the garage, and he took out his hammer, and he smashed off each of the wheels on my roller skates. No way. This is tough stuff. And as I stood up in these boots that used to have wheels on them and I was sliding around on the garage floor, my father looked out at me in disgust and he one said, day, one day you will thank me for this. Oh, this is tough stuff. It really... And Jack, I'm not going to lie to you. I went straight to bed. I missed my dinner. And I lay in that bed and I cried. <laughs> I cried and I cried all night. Because this is something, as a 23-year-old man, I had... What? You were 23 years old at the time? Well, yeah, I was 23. You know, the prime of my life. I thought you were like 12. No, Jack! Fuck, how could I become good in such a short time? I was 23. I had been doing this for years. Azard was probably 12, but I was 23. Jesus, Jack, are you listening to the story? Okay. Well, this is tough stuff, man. And, Jack... Uh... I mean, this is a story that I had to share. I had to put out there, Jack. Uh, yeah, me too, a little bit. I, I had to let you know that men can cry and still be strong. And I feel that I've wept, but I'm still strong. I can't top that. I can't top that. Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead. Spill your guts. You know, 
Let it all out. Be strong. Right. Uh... Ah, oh, fuck, man. With that story, this is going to bring it down a notch. I, it's when, when I'm doing the true crime thing, there are times, uh, you know, when, when I'm doing the research, it doesn't hit me so much. But when I bring it all together and it gets to a certain point in the story, especially when it has something to do with kids, especially if it comes to a 911 call where you can hear the children, say, screaming in the background. It happened to me recently where you could hear the kids, like, screaming for their father who's just killed their mother and they're going to lose their dad because he's killed the mom. And that happened to me recently where I just kind of broke break. And I can say, honestly, that that's about the only time that I've cried in a long time is, is quite recently and publicly on, on, an, on an episode. But you and I had spoken about it. And it, it hits you sometimes, doesn't it? What we do, what we do uh, in the moment. And if you are recording it, you have to ask yourself, do I put this out to the public? Is this going to make me look like a sissy? Maybe even a fruit, Jack. And uh, the answer is no. It's no if it's genuine and it's coming out. As long as you're not blubbering. Well, you know, I'm the same way. Uh, when I'm doing these intense or dark cases, especially when children are involved, you know, shit sneaks up to you. You get overwhelmed, and uh, I usually stop. And then I'll highlight it and delete it because I just don't want to give that. I think it's about giving how much you want to give of yourself to people. Yeah. Because it, it leaves you vulnerable. Do you want to be vulnerable? If you leave it in, it leaves you vulnerable to, to criticism, possibly. Yeah, I, 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 I leave myself out there all the time. So something like that, I, I just leave it in because I know that it's honest and I hope that the audience can understand that it's honest. But you're right. It, the, the price you pay is that someone can take it in a way and, and, and make fun of you for it or whatever. But I think it's, I think it's worth it if, if it's genuine. I mean, they don't know what the fuck's going on and uh, they're twisting into something that they want it to be twisted into. And, and if I know it's true, then I'm willing to leave it. So I'm interested, though. You just said that. So when you're doing true crime, when you're doing the stuff that we do, you've had times where where you've actually broken up a bit, eh? Yeah. Of course. Yeah, you know, I'm only human. And uh, different things affect me. And, you know, sometimes I'll cry out of frustration, uh, sadness. Or, you know, I'll even cry out of anger. But I'm not crying to solicit any money out of people. Uh, like a lot of individuals out there on YouTube who put their shocked face in the thumbnail, tell everybody how shocking it is all day. But that's no weakness, Jack. That's just us putting ourselves out there. Yeah, I'd agree. I think it hits me when I relate it to something when it has to do with my kids or it has to do with uh, the child version of myself. So there's, there's something difficult I went through in the past and I can relate to it then it suddenly brings that back and, and I can't help it, right? But uh, for the most part, I try not to cry. You wonder how emergency responders keep it together. Yeah, I, I've, I know guys, the paramedics, I'm sure you do too. They say that yes, when they have a quiet moment, maybe later on that evening, when they're seeing their kids run around and play around them, they just pulled a kid out of a car. Uh, earlier that day, it'll suddenly hit them later on. But in the moment, for the most part, I'm certain that they stay very professional. I'm reminded of an incident involving myself and some emergency responders. When I did the 6 o'clock news, years ago, I was your 6 o'clock news guy. And uh, that involved everything. It didn't. I eventually evolved into doing crime. But when I was the 6 o'clock news guy, I was just doing anything that was happening in the city. I worked for something called City Magazine. And it was just anything. You know, if there's an event, if there's a picnic, if there's a party. So, so it, at one such time, I was riding around with er, emergency responders. So I'd be in the car just to see how their, their, their day goes. And we were called out to a train station in Toronto. And we were right there. And these guys carrying their emergency kits. And a woman had... I still don't know how it had happened, but she had been pushed in or she'd fallen. This never became clear to me between the train and the ledge of the train, you know, where you stand. So she'd fallen into that small track area, that little space. And as she had fallen, the train, this is when the train was coming. So she was stuck in between the gap, you know, where they say mind the gap. In England, we say mind the gap. So you don't step into the gap. She had stepped, she had fallen, she'd been pushed, whatever reason, when the train was coming in. And the train had come in, Jack, and it had twisted her body like a top. Oh, I see. Yeah, peeled like an apple, shucked like a corn. Twisted right around with her upper body on the platform and her lower down below the train. No blood. 
No signs of injury. In fact, she seemed more annoyed. She was just there, talking to everybody. And the emergency services that were talking to her. And they yelled that we had to clear the platform. And they told the other guard that they had to call her family. Get them there as soon as possible. And I said to the guy, well, you know, she seems fine. What's the deal here? Just like, let's just get her out. And he just looked at me. He shook his head. And he said, she's been twisted in two. And the only thing holding her together is the train. If we move the train, she will fall in two and she will bleed out. There's nothing left of her. There's nothing we can do. So they brought this woman's family and they cleared the platform. They cleared the platform. You know, myself included, so her family could say goodbye to her, and that woman died. They moved the train, and she died. Instantly. Uh, you imagine being, I mean, there's a lot of pieces of that, pieces of that, to, to imagine being, imagine being the, uh, the train driver. It's like, okay, hit it. And that was the one and only time that I saw emergency responders crying. Yeah, and I cried too, uh... And I, I was angry with myself because I thought, this isn't professional. Yeah. And I went home and I, I just, I lay in bed and cried. And I told my girlfriend at the time and, you know, and she cried. And it was just that memory of talking to this woman who was essentially already dead. That was it for her. And uh, she didn't even know it. I think that when you're that close to death, um, you start... You have this uh, this switch that kind of goes off. You know you're about to die. I've seen it a few times that people are about to go and they're worried about everybody around them more so than themselves. It's almost like the endorphins go for them or something. Yeah. Where they 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 become the calmest person in the room. Isn't isn't that true? It's an odd thing. And they said that she was in shock. Yeah, and that would she be just didn't too. know what was happening. And they said what had happened to her was a one in a million thing. If she'd fallen a little sooner, she would have went on the tracks and been killed instantly. If she'd fallen a little later, she would have been thrown back on the platform. But it was that just that that millisecond in time that she fell. Yeah. That she went in between between the train and the platform. Did they clear the family away when they moved the train? Did they leave her alone when they moved the train? I'm guessing they let the family say their goodbyes and they cleared the platform and the emergency workers had to do what they had to do, and then mop up the mess. I, I've, I've held a couple of hands while people are passing children uh, in homes that I work in and all that stuff, too, two of them. That would be terrible. Mm. And they just start looking at you, and I won't get into all that. But um, I'm reminded of an image I saw when that uh, the earthquake happened in Turkey. Yeah, where the little kid died trapped under the rocks. Yeah, holding hands with his what was his grandfather or something like that <sighs> that stuff's wild man <sighs> that for the grace of God but you know Jack I think we better get into our tales here uh, before we both start blubbering and uh, while I let you get yourself together uh, I figure I'll go first if that's okay with you our first tale Jack is going to take us to northwest Minneapolis June 17th 2021 6.15 in the morning, as a jogger, out enjoying the day, getting exercise, which is important, Jack, if you want to live a long life. And as this jogger makes his way along this paved trail by the side of the Mississippi River, he sees something up ahead on a picnic bench. Perhaps someone out playing basketball at the nearby court had left that ball there. But as they move closer, Jack, they discover it's not a basketball but it's someone's head. Sitting there with his eyes wide open, just minding his own business. Looking like a goddamn religious icon. And on this head that sits without a body, minding his own business, is written the word perv. Right there on the forehead, Jack. It's a little unusual. You damn skippy it is. And that's short for pervert for any of you listeners who are ignorant. It's carved into this individual's head. So this person fucking freaks out. Fucking goes nuts, runs, phones the police. And the police show up. And the first thing they notice, that although the weather is hot, 
This head has been on ice, Jack. It's frozen. Weird. Like a goddamn TV dinner, Jack. <laughs> Except this isn't Swanson's, and there's no peas or watery applesauce. <laughs> no, no uh, overheated brownie. Lane, none so. of the above, Jack. None of the above. And the cops, they can't figure out what's happened here. They, the cops, they're thinking what's happened here. I mean, there's no struggle. There's no blood. <laughs> Who does the head belong to? They don't have a clue. And with no blood or body parts, Jack. And the fact that it's been frozen. So it's been frozen. Someone has kept it on ice and stored it. Took it out. Carved the name Perv on it because no blood came out. Deeply, I might add. Deeply, this is carved into the head. So someone made a nice effort. And then put it on this bench. So over the next six weeks, Jack, they start finding more body parts. Frozen as well? If they weren't, they had been, Jack. And they were spread all over Minneapolis. They find a cock. Ooh. A hand. An arm. They find a leg in the Mississippi River. Yeah. So these body parts have been placed in different locations. Some public, some not so public. But the police say, and here's the thing, Jack. The police say that they have been posed for maximum shock effect. Now they haven't right. gone into details. And I'm not sure how you would pose a cock to make right. it more shocking than it already is, but that's what the police say. That these body parts were posed to send an intentional message. Right. This seems to be troubling you, Jack. Speak up. You're amongst friends. Well, I was going to I was going to say when when somebody does this, when they spread the body parts apart, it's like uh to me, you have a better chance of your crime not being discovered burying it maybe in one spot rather than putting it out there in multiple spots. So so your initial thought on that is like they're just trying to spread the parts so that they can't put it all together for lack of a better term, but I mean no, the the reasoning is so that people will find it all and they're trying to terrorize the community and also further disrespect their victim in my opinion. Exact mundo, Jack. Exact mundo. And that's what the cops also think, that this is someone who not only wants to humiliate the victim, but they want to send out a message. And if you think about it, Jack, this isn't unlike what something that the cartels would do. They do this a lot in Mexico. Yes. Send a message. You want to cross us. This is what you want. This is what you get. Yeah, and they'll, they'll often um, put the parts in plastic, which is a way that unintentionally but you're preserving evidence in that too it's it's uh it's holding on to the evidence mm -hmm. in the bag it's not being exposed to elements and bugs and all that kind of stuff too mm -hmm. which is interesting so this is what the cops are thinking now remarkably or not so remarkably due to the general moral decay of modern civilization there are CCTV cameras at each of the locations where the body parts were found, Jack. Okay. But it equally won't surprise you, Jack, when I tell you that none of those cameras at the said locations were working. <laughs> no, I'm not surprised. I'm not. They never are. You know, I have a, a suggestion that I could put forward to Minneapolis's local districts and councils. Perhaps yeah. they could use some of that money that they take in from people parking tickets and fines that are ridiculously high and they could take that money and put it back into the cameras and fix them so they would work what do you think jack yeah for sure and even when they do have the footage it's always and uh, super grainy i posted a picture on my instagram one time you know those photos of outer space that are crystal clear of these other universes and shit out there the the new ones that we're getting from that new uh, telescope out there we have those images from deep, deep space, and then you have a guy walking into a store about to buy a shovel, and you can barely see his face because it's so pixelated. I, I, more money needs to be put into the, uh, these cameras, certainly. Priorities, Jack. Priorities. So the cops start poking around and investigating this frozen head and the rest of the limbs and the cock and whatnot. And however, and there's no documentation of how they found out, they eventually find out who this gentleman and extremities were. I'm guessing missing person reports. Mm -hmm. And this is a couple of months later that they come up with the name of one Adam Johnson. A homeless man. Someone who has suffered from 
mental health issues, drug addiction. A man who has had troubles, documented troubles. He's got two kids. He has a girlfriend or had a girlfriend. They were having difficulties. He has former partners. Uh, and he, of course, he's had issues with drugs. Hmm? But by all accounts, he doesn't have an enemy in the world. Right. Not an enemy in the world, Jack. But I'm going to put it to you that he appears to have had at least one. Now, here's a bit of a surprise, Jack. The autopsy showed that he had no drugs in his system at the time of his death. Huh. All right. Johnson had last been seen about a week before his death, caught on a bus's CCTV camera, throwing a bag of excrement on a bus driver. Oh, that's not good. Well, I mean, we all know how bus drivers can be. I mean, how many times have you gone on to a bus? It's the last bus home. You pull out your ticket and there's a bit of it's damage from the snow and they tell you they won't accept it and get off the bus. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sometimes these guys got it coming. Yeah, man, more like a service, in my opinion, with my interaction with bus drivers. Yeah, yeah it's, I it's, agree. And they're usually rude. So, but this is the last time he was seen, believe it or not, throwing a bag of fecal matter and urine on a bus driver. Wow. Because his ticket wasn't valid. Now, as mentioned, this Johnson has two very young kids uh, with an ex-partner. Uh, who seems to be a lovely woman. She appears to be disabled. Uh, I'm not sure she's always sitting. Which I guess is neither here nor there to this particular story. And she says nothing but good things about him. She says that he wouldn't hurt a fly. I mean, they always say this, and he wouldn't hurt a fly. But, I mean, she's saying good things about him. And they spoke to several other ex-partners and friends. And they all said good things about him, Jack. Which I think is positive because you know, you know how I feel about uh, asking I do. Ex-girlfriends. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say, it wouldn't be the same for you. Yeah. Uh, or me, Yeah. to be fair. You're, you're never going to have an ex-girlfriend say something positive about you. You know, any anything. You know, did he do that? You know, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think your uh, ex-boyfriend would fuck a corpse? Oh, I think there's a distinct possibility <laughs> he had a boner at my grandmother's funeral. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at his lips. And, you know, this is how they are. Women can be vindictive, Jack, especially exes. But apparently not. Adam's exes all had good things to say about him. And by all accounts, Adam was working at turning his life around. And just the day before, he had attempted to check himself into a mental health facility. So tell me, Jack, in your expert opinion, what's going on here? What is the caper here? Well... <sighs> But let me give you the last bit of information on the case here, Jack, because this has now been handed over to the FBI. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, I phoned the Minneapolis police, and I asked them on an update on this case, because I happened to know someone there. And I asked them, I said, like, what's the deal? You got any updates on this big mystery? And they said to me that they're too busy to handle this. This has been passed over to the FBI... And get this, Jack. They figure there was a there was a gunshot wound on one of the legs, so they figure it was an accidental shooting. Oh, okay. And he may have died of natural causes. <laughs> did, did, did they accidentally carve the word "perv" into his forehead too? Well, exactly. They wouldn't. They, they had no comment on that, but they said that they have passed it on to the FBI. And if I want to talk to the FBI, good luck. You know, basically, yeah, because, you know, the FBI are going to be returning my calls, aren't they? So that's where it stands. They figure the cops say they have no time for it. It's been passed on to the FBI. And they figure the public aren't at risk because this guy had a gunshot wound that appeared to be self-inflicted. And it didn't kill him. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't a uh, fatal gunshot wound. Right. Well, the head was intact. So, so they, don't know, they don't know what killed him. And the FBI have it now. Okay. And that's uh, like a year ago. There's a last update on this from what I'm seeing here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts here on this, Jack? And I know it's an emotional one, so don't start tearing up on us. I'll try not to. I'll tighten up my roller skates here. You had to take a cheap shot, Jack, didn't you? A cheap shot at my uh, personal story to you. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you, Jack Luna. Fuck you. <laughs> Up the ass until it bleeds. <laughs> well, the thing 
This, okay, so Perv is is carved into his forehead, which gives me the impression that he had done something that nobody is aware of, and whoever did this to him felt that way, or dead bug that they're doing that as a red herring and trying to get the public and, and the police to kind of dismiss him thinking, okay, this guy's a perv who gives a fuck. Like he's a pedophile. Like is that, that would to me would say perv would be a pedophile, to me. Pedophile. Me too, me too. Uh, just screwing around with a woman or someone else's woman, that wouldn't no, that, qualify as perv no, to me. No, definitely not. I mean, this, this is the ultimate. For me, they're saying perv, they're sending a message, but Jack, the large group of friends and his exes say that this isn't the case. They stand behind him and say, definitely not. I'll tell you exactly what, what I think, uh, just on first, first impression. I think that he got into some kind of altercation with some low-down, dirty people because he's in low-down, dirty situations. And that person might be mentally ill. And they've decided to take this opportunity to have their big, weird, serial killer style moment where sometimes in the past there have been women who have been posed or their body parts have been strewn about and they'll carve their chest a word like whore or bitch. And I'll ask you this, like when, when, you, when a woman is found with anything carved into them, um, it's dismissed as the person, the perpetrator just being a, a sicko. I think that in this situation, because it's a man and the word is perv, the public is probably swayed in a small way, like, well, maybe he got what he had coming to him. Um, we'll take seriously a... Someone sending a message, Jack. Right? And then the cops would think and the public would think that this guy had it coming. He was up to no good. But let me put it to you this way, Jack. Maybe they did it as a cover-up. Yes. And I'll tell you something else that, that indicates that we're possibly on the right track here is that this person is well thought out because the body is found frozen, which means they kept it for a period of time to screw up the time of death. Um, or or not, maybe they're not that intelligent, but they, they've they thought this out because they had to sit with this body for a period of time if they froze it. Well, there's a case over here in the UK that involved the murder of a schoolgirl, and she was 16 years old, and her name was Leanne Tierman. And she'd been abducted just before Christmas, returning from a shopping trip with a friend. And they found her body the following year in August, laying in the forest, and it was perfectly preserved. Although it was eight months later, uh, when they found her, she looked like she was taking a nap in the grass. And then when forensics went and checked the body, uh, they had found out that she had been in and out of the freezer. And they figured that the guy, the, the pedophile had been taken in her, in her, her in and out of the freezer, he'd fuck her, then he'd put her back in. Yes. And then he'd take her out when he wanted to use her again, uh, you know, like a, like a fucking TV dinner. He was taking her in and out. And, but the one part too, now here's where the real cleverness comes in, which I, like you said, we're, we're, we're giving these people credit that they, they might be clever. But forensics could never, ever say for sure. Now, I know a lot of people who were close to this girl or the family say that, no, no, she wasn't sexually abused, is that the forensics couldn't, they couldn't tell anything because the body was frozen and refrozen, so they, they couldn't tell if she'd been t had sex with. I mean, what else, fucking else would it be, you know? But they could see that there was anal tearing and there was uh, va some ripping in the vaginal, and a, a pedophile was eventually arrested and charged for abduction but not sexual interference. And you know, some people, they just want to ignore the truth and uh, because they're happier with just abduction opposed to the sexual aspect. Not wanting the victim to be treated in such a heinous way. I put it to you, why was he taking her in and out of the freezer so much? Uh, you know, to watch a movie with? Movie night? No. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, extending it for that purpose. Uh. So you think that these guys did this because they're smart or this is just totally by I think uh, there's a few there's a few answers to that question, but I, I'm leaning towards the the person doing this. Uh, probably in a dispute between the two, the person is fucked up. Maybe there's a group of them who did this, and uh, they decided to freeze the body, obviously. And then when it came time to getting rid of it, they decided to have some fun with it, uh, strewing it about the city. But when I say about the the frozen thing and trying to uh, disrupt the time of death and all that. That was Richard Kuklinski, the hitman. Um, they called him the Iceman. Of course. They made a movie of course, about yeah, him yeah. who would do that, yeah. right? He did that for that purpose. So I don't want to put them in the same category, whoever did this as that. 
Um, I just think they didn't know what to do with them for a period of time, and then they decided, hey, maybe we'll uh, be, be clever. Yeah, try to be clever. And they have well, been clever to this point. Let's give them credit, because they haven't caught them. Well, the, well, the FBI have said that they believe that... Uh, he, he may have been killed in front of, and I don't know why this is uh, a group of people, right? And that they're all they're they're all afraid to talk, and they they feel it could be cartel related. But for me, the piece, the pieces don't fit. This guy was just a junkie with mental health issues who was trying to get help. He was trying to get his life together. Uh, I, I I don't see him being a, a big enough deal for this attention. It's not high level. No, exactly. He just mm-hmm. looks—he just looks like a street guy, doesn't he? Like just one of those wise guys going around trying. The type would be bumming a cigarette at you off, asking if you had some change for some soup and whatnot. Right, but you do have to consider that maybe he was a pervert, and maybe there's something going on that we don't know about. I mean, he did throw a bag of shit at a fucking bus driver, which is a little weird, don't you think? <laughs> like uh, maybe he did do something low, de- like sneaky, underhanded uh, with with a child or with with a with a 14 year old girl who whose father was involved with something and found out. Maybe maybe he was um, wrongly accused by whoever did this to him as doing something he didn't do, and they just figured it was him. He he's he's. Yeah, on the streets, he's in these strange situations. Um, maybe he did do something fucked up. Okay, so you're saying there is a chance that this guy could have, uh, could be a perv. I'd say anybody with the word perv carved in their forehead might qualify as someone who possibly did something perverted. So where there's smoke, there's fire, Jack. I mean, that's what you're saying to us. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Oh. You have to consider it. Okay, but then I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw it back to you here, Jack. I'm going to throw it back to you mm-hmm. here. And I'm going to say that uh, maybe it's just people hating on homeless, fucking around, and maybe the police, who say they're too busy to handle the case, uh, because they say they say uh, it was a self-inflicted wound, and he wasn't murdered. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say to you that it's just the cops saying we don't give a fuck because it's just another stiff who's a homeless person. I I can totally agree with that. And giving the information to the public that he had the word perv carved to his forehead. Don't you think that's a piece of information they should have probably kept to themselves? Yeah, I th- like, I, th- I think so, too. Well, they did keep it in the beginning, because this this reminds me a lot of that story you told me about the uh, the guy in uh, Houston, or was it uh, or was it Arizona, uh, who um, Arizona, it was, yeah. was set the on homeless fire, guy. The, the homeless guy. You know, he's just victimized for being homeless. Right. It does. Yeah, it does. Just, just fucking around with him. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, dude, putting his head on a bench, I, I see this bench now. It's right when you come in down that path when you're running or you're riding your bike. It's just off the road. The person who dropped these pieces off could have been riding a bike themselves, which which might be indicative of them being within the homeless community because, you know, those homeless guys who just steal fucking Amazon boxes off of porches yeah, and shit. Yeah. Could be like a group of one of these guys, a friend of his, somebody he knows. And just started dropping them around. Yeah. This park bench, they, they didn't even clean this bench off, uh, which is reminiscent of, of that case, too. There's blood there. Which makes you wonder what park services are spending all their money on, because they certainly aren't spending it on working CCTV cameras. So there you have it, Jack. As of this episode of Tales from the Bottom Down, this case remains unsolved. And if there are leads, they ain't telling us. And we've both given our thoughts on it, so... And for me, this is a sad one because he's obviously fallen through the cracks of society, and he's trying to—he's trying to pull himself back up. He's—you know—he's got two young children, um, a pretty girlfriend, ex-girlfriend who, who still appears to love him. And I, you know, in cases like this, I always think that uh, that uh, everybody is someone's child. You know, every one of these people have a mother and family members um, that will miss them, and. Uh, you know, I don't hold much hope of this case getting solved uh, because I think priority-wise, uh, a druggie and a homeless man, you know, it's not high on the list, let's uh, be honest here. Um, but fingers crossed, and if there are any updates, uh, I'll pass them along. So what do you got for us, Jack? You got something good? I think so. Uh, I'm going to take my dark tale to a small skiing village in Colorado. Uh, the name of it is Breckenridge. And we're going back to early 1982, Dead Bug. This is the late evening of January the 6th, 1982. Nice. 
This is my favorite year for true crime. I just love everything about it. The smells, the sounds, the the yellowed photographs. It, it, it just, for me, I, I, I love this year. Yes. Yeah, I know you can. Um, so there's a snowstorm that has brought this former mining town at the base of the Rocky Mountains, 10-mile range, to a standstill. I'll try to paint the picture a bit for you. Like, you would see this on a postcard. You you might think that Santa Claus lives in this little mountain village, uh, going from a bird's-eye view. And there's this snowstorm rolling in, something similar to what's going on outside my little garage studio in the middle of nowhere right now, dead bug. Uh, we're currently being swallowed by a spring snowstorm out here, and it's early morning, not late evening as it is in the story, but, you know, it's dark outside, and whenever this happens, these storms roll in to small places like Brecking Ridge in this mountain community or out on the prairie where I'm at. I just, uh, that's how I picture it. It's being swallowed. You know, a little patch of people huddled in their homes being swallowed by the storm. Mm. Nice. And, uh, like I said, it's 1982, and back then you didn't have everyone tuned to their cell phones for weather alerts. The news would get around through word of mouth. Usually, like, the farmers or whoever w- would know about this. They looked at their their almanac, and they know what's about to happen. And... Well, you remember you remember when we were kids. Remember when you're a kid, Jack? You'd wake up, and now my uh, basement was uh, my uh, bedroom mm-hmm. was in the basement, and you would wake up, and you knew it was a snow day because you couldn't yeah, hear oh, cars. That's interesting. Yeah, it deadens everything because the snow. It was, you, you just you. It was a dead. There was silence everywhere, and you knew yeah. snow day. Yeah, I didn't live in the basement, but I had this weird room that should have been a closet, and outside of my window. Um, that's where they piled all the garbage, and I that would deaden the noise. But I could look, I'd look at the window, and I would see I would just see the sheets of snow coming down. And I'd think the same. I'd be like, wow, it's gonna be everything felt felt very different. Like you said, it, yeah, the silence of no cars, the out crunching there. sound as the wheels uh, rolled over the fresh mm, snow. Yeah, yes, yeah, people struggling to get to work because it could be a snow it's a snow day for the kids, but often uh, workers would be pushed to go to work regardless, right? The plight of the common man, Jack. So anyways, this is what's happening. And um, people, they would meet up at the old town saloon here in uh, Breckenridge. They'd ride out the storm together when this type of thing would happen. They know next day they probably won't have to go to work because it's going to be real bad. Treacherous. I mean, there's, there's hills... And uh, when you get a snowstorm in a hilly area, the, everything's shut down. You can't fucking drive through this stuff. It doesn't matter how... Uh, it doesn't matter if you have chains on your tires. It shuts it down. And I guess the location means that the snow plows... Or there's probably not a lot of snow plows hitting the roads like they are in Toronto or something. Right. Yes. No, there isn't. There isn't. They probably have one snow plow. Like where I'm at, <sighs> good luck. You know, that's, that's the plow's coming in a couple of days. So... They ride out the storm together, surrounded by mountains and trees, drinking at the at the downtown saloon. Uh, there's so much history, dead bug, in this place. This is a haunted little place, initially brought to life by the gold rush, like I said. And I think you'd like this spot. You already said that you like this time. But this spot in particular, it's very historic, uh, colorful, uh, because of its history, but also the buildings are all kind of different colors. It's, a, it's an old mining town. Like, think of old, old Wild West, kind of. And... Uh, you know, back in the 80s, I think you would have liked it. Maybe not today. The hipsters have taken it over and pussified it quite a bit. But back then, I think you would have really liked it. It sounds ideal. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. You might be in that saloon and enjoying the company of a couple of blondes as the bar lights flickered and the old wooden saloon shifted with each buffet of the storm. Nice, nice. You know the place. I do, Jack. Me sitting there with a rum and a Coke and a big boner. Yeah, with your, with your, <laughs> with the wheels of your fucking uh, roller skates knocked off, sitting down, just taking a break with a few blondes. But I wouldn't be wearing the roller skates because that would be embarrassing. I would just be sitting there with them so these women knew uh, what I was into. And uh, <laughs> I'd just be chilling. A chilling, Jack. Mark it if you will, but chicks dig a guy in roller skates. Oh, especially the way that you would you would hang on to them. They would be tied together with the shoelaces. They'd be around your neck, I'm assuming. 
You goddamn right they would be, Jack. But I'm getting the feeling that this flattery is turning quickly into mockery. <laughs> All right, I'll move. So, uh, so speaking of blondes, it'll be the misfortune of two of them to get stuck without a ride home this night. Both had been in town uh, drinking, and neither would make it home. At least one of them was drinking. And let me interrupt you right here, Jack. These are good-looking girls. I mean, you're failing to tell the listeners this, but these girls are tasty, Jack. Yes. Yeah, classic blondes of the era. They look like sunshine girls. You know, page three sunshine girls from uh, the Toronto Sun. Yeah. These two girls could be sunshine girls, Jack. Yeah, I'm familiar more with the sunshine boys, but yeah, I heard that there were sunshine girls in that paper too. There were, Jack. <laughs> and, I'm starting to get and worried they about had, you. Uh, but they would have but, the uh, I believe from rumor that the sunshine boys were on uh, page 47. <laughs> That's exactly the page. For those... Uh, Certain men who would enjoy that sort of thing. Yeah, the Sunshine Boys. I think we talked about this before. They were in black and white. Yes, exactly. You, you, you were robbed of the color. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe they were doing that to us. So homophobic. <laughs> so, <laughs> trying to take away from the sexiness of the situation, but they, uh, uh, these girls, they like they, they, the feathered, you know, the blonde yeah, hair. Fair faucet, Anyways, fair faucet hair, all yes. feathered. That's the woman I was looking for. So their loved ones initially assume they'd weathered at the storm and shacked up with friends. So they're not too worried when they don't come home that evening. The first one I'll talk to you about is Annette Schnee. She was 21 years old, working as a cocktail waitress. And uh, she also worked at the Holiday Inn in uh, town in Breckenridge, this small Colorado town. And the pretty blonde had left work at around 4.30 p.m. She had a prescription to pick up from the pharmacy. And Annette, she would often hitchhike home, Mm -hmm. something that was commonplace in the area and and beyond back in 82. But It was, it was. Yeah, but this place in particular, because everyone considered it really safe to do it there. Everyone knows everybody in this town. I think the population was around 5,000 people. Mm Mm-hmm. And usually you wouldn't be picking up a ride or grabbing a ride from a stranger. It would be someone you knew. Yeah. And these two girls were known to hitchhike, but they also were known to be very careful about doing so. So they would normally just take a ride from someone that they knew. And they wouldn't take rides from two men Mm -hmm. in a vehicle, which is a a known uh, intelligent move back then. Mm -hmm. You should only take rides from a single driver. And there's a 21-year-old girl that, uh, I mean, living out in the middle of nowhere. So, I mean... Although smart, I mean, she's not street smart. She sounds like a country girl to me. I mean, she looks, but uh, she's gorgeous. This 21-year-old, she goes missing at 4.30. The last time people see her is either at a bar or just walking along the street after the pharmacy. She would go for drinks after work sometimes. Uh, she, like I said, she was a cocktail waitress and knew the scene. But she she won't turn up again until the following summer. Jesus. And I'm going to leave it at that for now and move on to the details of this other vanished blonde, this dark and stormy night, because what happens to her, we know more immediately. It is 29-year-old Bobby Joe Oberholzer, who had been out celebrating a promotion from secretary to office manager of a real estate office Mm -hmm. she worked at. She was um, out having drinks with friends, certainly. And like Annette, Bobby Joe wouldn't make it home. Her husband, Jeff, would become worried and head out around midnight looking for his young wife, braving the elements and checking into every bar to no avail. He even goes to some of her friends' places and he ends up waking people up and they're like, no, last time we saw her was around 7.30, Jeff. So he's very worried. Yeah, that's a worry. And she's <sighs> yeah, she's a good-looking th- girl as well. She's a good-looking girl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if she was, if she wasn't, you'd be less worried. Yeah, she's okay. Fucking, you know, she's okay. So she's out somewhere, but she, you know, she's so fucking ugly. I don't care. She'll be back. There's no one's gonna hurt her. She's safe because I mean, that's Jack. That is a general rule in life. Uh, I don't want to digress, but if you're you're really fucking ugly, you're okay. You're, you're <laughs> safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one plus of that. But unfortunately for her, it's not the case in her situation. Yeah. She is very pretty. Mm-hmm. And if I was him, I'd be thinking, I don't know the relationship. Maybe she went off with another guy, you know, 
that's that's a possibility. But Jeff doesn't think so. They're close, and uh, they, they have a great relationship. Well, no guy ever thinks so. <laughs> Let's face it, right, no guy. Exactly. You know, would your girl mm-hmm. cheat on you? Never. She's got never. me. You know, never. You know, so there's always a possibility, Jack. You know, I used to have a saying as a kid, women are like cute little kittens. And if they're cute little kittens, chances are they got an owner. And you can take that to the bank, Jack. Tell all your friends. Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, you know. Yeah. If you're ugly, you're protected by genetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tired old cats end up at the pound. Yeah. Or fighting for scraps at the junkyard. You better stop right there, Jack. We're getting misogynistic. So this guy basically thinks that his woman hasn't run off with someone else. He he suspects foul play. Yes. And I know that he's concerned about her because she regularly hitchhikes. Bobby Joe, like young Annette, had often hitchhiked after work. Jeff, uh, he'd been concerned about this habit of his wife's. He'd given Bobby Joe a heavy brass ring. It's, it would be car keys, but she doesn't have a car. And that's what exactly what it looks like. It looks like a big brass ring with a hook at the end of it that you can uh, wrap around your knuckles and uh, it certainly looks like it, it could do some damage. Yes, it's got a hook, yes. And he's given it to her so that she could keep it on her and place it over two fingers. It's big enough for that for her to slide two fingers in when alone. And the idea being she could use it like a brass knuckle if in danger. And that's what it looks like, brass knuckles. Have you ever been hit with brass knuckles or someone holding a bar in their hand, like a metal bar in their hand? Ever been punched with that or hit anybody with that? No, but I can't imagine it being a pleasant experience. What about you, Jack? You ever been kissed by your brass sweetheart? I have. So, you know, I've been in fights and been punched in the face and all that, but I once was in an argument with a group of guys with my friends, and one of them came at me and sideswiped me with a metal bar in his hand, punched me in the side of the head, and knocked me out cold. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, fortunately, I had my friends around to kind of crowd around me and drag me out, but it was like uh, lights out, man. Lights, it was like get hit with a brick. Jesus, Jack, where do you and your buddies hang out? Attica's exercise yard? (laughs) But I guess the positive thing is you were with your friends. Yeah, it was a cheap shot, but unlike any punch I've ever taken in my life with that metal bar on the guy's hand. So even even a lighter, even a lighter held in your hand will make the difference of just uh, stabilizing the knuckles to get a good clean shot. Well, I'll keep that in mind the next time the mailman is late. <laughs> but we're digressing here, Jack. Carry on. We have two pretty blondes vanished under cover of the previous night's blizzard in this sleepy ski resort village nestled in the mountains. And I'll say that they find Bobby Joe, whose husband is looking for her, almost immediately. A rancher discovers her wallet the next morning. The contents of it are blowing around his driveway. Yeah. Around 7.30 a.m., he finds uh, this evidence. And with this information, he's able to go to the phone book and get a hold of the husband, Oberholzer. And he answers, worried. And he comes over to the ranch. The the rancher tells him where he's at. He's not too far away. And Jeff begins looking around and finds his wife's backpack in a snowdrift. Also, one of Bobby Joe's gloves with blood on it. Some Kleenex with blood on it. The brass ring, the brass ring that he gave her, he doesn't discover it right away. I think it's lost in the snow and they find it later. But it's also in the driveway. This is a terrible thing. Uh, that you'd have to find your loved one like this. It's just terrible. Uh, something, I, I'm guessing, just be in your head forever. Just just terrible to go out and to have your fears confirmed, which I'm guessing they were when he found her body. Yeah, and he begins doing the investigation. Jeff, right away, I mean, he rounds up some friends. It's funny because it's 82, so it's not like you're just calling people on your cell phone. He's driving around in this shitty weather now, right? It's the next morning, the plows that we talked about haven't come through, he's slipping and he's sliding. But he gets up a, a group of friends and they begin cross-country skiing. A nearby pass, I think it was called Hoosier Pass, where Bobby Joe was known to at times hitchhike through after work. And they soon discover her body in the snow, dead bug. Frozen. So the police don't discover the body? No. And I guess because in these rural areas, when these big snowstorms hit or snow fronts move in, the only way to move around is on skis, cross-country skiing. That's exactly what's happened. That's exactly what's happened. So they find the body, it's frozen in the shadow of a mountain. And investigators are soon on the scene. 
it's possible they, they bring fire trucks out there, which can get through a lot more, or maybe a plow. Maybe they do get the plow to plow it through. I don't have that information, but I'm assuming this kind of thing happened to be able to clear the way. She is clothed. On one of her wrists, there's a zip tie. She's been shot in the chest. Terrifying, because when you see that twist tie, you know that she was incapacitated and she wasn't able to move. These are the same sort of twist ties that the cops use when they, when they want to arrest a lot of people at once. Yes, especially if there's a group, they want to quickly apprehend a few people and just uh, disable them while they figure out what's going on. I mean, you can only imagine the terror that this young woman must have felt. So she's been shot in the chest, and some accounts say twice in the face. But I read that her husband, Jeff, identified her by her face in the body bag. See, what happened was the cross-country skiers get there. They're able to notify the police. Jeff's not quite on the scene yet when the police get there. And by the time he does get there, they, are, they have put her in a body bag already. And he has to ask them to unzip it to, to expose her face. And he breaks down crying, uh, yeah, that's her. That's my wife. Well, let's not discount her being shot in the face. I've been on a few crime scenes, and sometimes the bullet wounds can be little holes. It doesn't even look like a bullet wound, and it doesn't uh, mess up the rest of the face. It just all depends on the caliber and the positioning. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Could be. Like I said, there's conflicting accounts. But So, in the same article that I read on this, which was giving me actual quotes from Jeff and the investigators... It is said in that one that she'd been shot twice in the chest. But an important detail here, there is an orange woman's sock, like a, it's, it's clearly a woman's sock, it's orange, found by the body. And the interesting part about this, although it's a woman's sock, it doesn't belong to the victim. So we'll get to that, but the husband, Jeff, he is considered to be the prime suspect right off the bat, though there's no proof that he's done this. Well, that's pretty standard practice when you're investigating the unexplained death of a loved one. Yeah, it is. It is. But he doesn't do himself any favors, Debo, because when Jeff learns of 21-year-old Annette Schnee disappearing the same night, um, in one of his many interviews with police, later, you know, weeks later, he claims to have had a premonition that this other girl, Annette, is going to be found just a few miles from his house on July the 4th of 1982. Jesus. He's, he's like a seer, like he thinks that he is, a psychic or something. He's like, listen, I'm starting to have some visions. So he's a soothsayer, a Kreskin, a goddamn hillbilly Nostradamus. <laughs> well, why, why, I mean, he's just, he's also very, I guess, honest. It's hard to say that about someone who would claim something like that because he's... Or maybe stupid, Jack. You initially think he's a fucking wacko, right? But he's being honest. He's had these dreams about this other girl being found. And Deadbug, she is found on July 3rd of 82. He said July 4th. She's found. What? Like six months later? Six months later. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. The same year. In the summer. And he's already said July 4th, and he's found, she's found on July 3rd by a young boy fishing. He discovers Annette Schnee's body in Sacramento Creek, which is only seven miles from Jeff, the widower's house, who says she'll be found near my house on July 4th. And this kid finds her almost in that location, face down in a crack. Right. Yeah, he's fishing, and he goes, runs to his father, and his father calls uh, police. So, when they get there to this creek, they find that she's been shot in the back. She's face down in the water. She's been frozen over over the rest of the winter there. Uh, there's an exit wound at her chest. The angle they can see well, upon investigating further is that it was downward at about 30 degrees, indicating she may have been running away down the hill towards the creek when she was gunned down, or... She'd been executed. Yeah. I mean, either way, Jack, what a, a horrible way to go. A horrible way. I can't imagine which way would be worse. But for me, her running away thinking maybe she's free and then getting gunned down. Here's the thing. Both victims didn't die from their wounds initially. They both died from the elements they deduce. How horrible, Jack. How horrible. What a way for your life to be ended, these poor, poor young ladies. 
I can't even imagine. And in these elements, the cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in Bobby Joe, the first girl's case, they think she escaped the vehicle. I'll get to that. And she was shot and then left there to die in the elements. And it would be a slow death because the the blood would be like molasses because of the temperatures and the oh, freezing. I never thought about that. It would cauterize in a way, maybe, eh? Uh, and then the other girl, Annette, they think that she escaped as well, or he let her go, and as she was running away, he shot her. That's one of the possibilities, and she crawled into the creek. Crawled uh, onto the frozen creek and then eventually sunk into it. That's, that's too, they think that that's probably what happened. Fuck. The similarities in these girls' murders are, are disturbing. Well, check this out then. So one thing is that the bullet that is recovered from Annette and the bullet that was recovered from the Bobby Joe crime scene, they, f are, they figure out that it came from the same gun, mm. that, which ties the two. But also tying the two murders is that on Annette, when they find her in the creek, she has a bare foot and the other one has an orange sock on her. Now this is disturbing, Jack. It's disturbing, but it can only lead to one conclusion. The same guy, the same guy. Bingo. The same night, hours apart. And I'll get to that as well, because I'll kind of paint, paint the scene for us. But also in this younger girl, like Annette's possession is one of John Oberholzer's business cards, who is the husband of the other victim, who's being seen as the prime suspect. You're pulling my leg, right? No, I know. <laughs> Yeah. You're kidding, Jack. A business card for his small appliance repair company. Yeah, I bet he wanted to repair and get inside of her piping. <laughs> right. So he's... Something doesn't seem right here, Jack. This girl doesn't seem to me the type who'd worry about her fridge being broken. Right. Uh, he, he is questioned on that, and he goes, oh, shit, because he's been saying... He's been saying to this point, I haven't met this guy. I have no idea who this is because they questioned him on Annette. And then when they find the card, they ask him again. And he's like, oh, wait a minute. I remember picking her up hitchhiking and I gave her a business card. I always do that. I always give everybody my business yeah, card. Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> so they're they're like, it's John. John's, John's done both of these. One thing I should mention is that Annette had, she wasn't just in her sock and her bare foot. She had boots on and they, and they were, were on, on the, the wrong, wrong feet. feet because it says jack that there's no sign of uh sexual uh uh interference but her 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 boots were on the wrong feet and her zip is broken yes you got it investigators they figure that is that john must have picked up a net schnee on her way home on january the 6th of 82 and killed her clothing on the body looks to have been put on funny like he said like in a rush the boots are on the wrong feet the zipper's broken on the jeans uh, the idea is that John raped her somewhere in the woods, had her put her clothes back on, then driven her to the creek and let her go and decided to execute her as she was running away or just straight up executed her on her knees and she rolled down the hill. I like that. I like the thought that, uh, not like, but I, I like is the theory that that he did let her go, Let say he's letting her go. And then he shot her. It's a little better that... Uh, Forcing someone on their knees and them knowing, yeah. Because maybe uh, she had a second of hope. Okay, yeah, me too. So she apparently, Annette, had lost her sock. And this is just what they're hypothesizing. They think that she had lost her sock in John's truck. Because when John allegedly later picked up and shot his wife at 730, the sock fell out when she got out of the vehicle to run away from John and fell onto the ground when she got out, which is incredible that the sock would have been left in the vehicle and then dragged out by the next victim later, tie linking the two crime scenes. This is incredible. This is incredible. So this is what they're thinking, but why would he kill his own wife and then go out and get someone else who's, who looks just as tasty? You got it. Well, the thing is, that uh, he didn't kill his fucking wife. He didn't do this. John, he passes polygraphs, a couple of them, he also has an alibi of being at work, then with friends. Iron tight alibis? Because polygraphs aren't admissible in court. Right. No, they're not iron tight, but he does have an alibi as well. And uh, it's enough for the case to go cold for four decades. Holy fuck. And in that time, DNA found at the murder scenes, when DNA comes to be valid, 
right? Uh, it clears John Albohotzer completely. He's cleared based on the DNA. The blood that's on his wife's glove is not his blood. It's another man's. Well, they don't know who. How soon was he cleared? Did this take years for him to be cleared until DNA? It took years. So he was always a suspect. Yes, he was exiled from the community. Everybody thought that it was him. No one would let him in their house. He had no friends all of a sudden. He, I think he had to move. But even though even though he had an alibi and the polygraph said that he didn't do it, this the, the public uh, opinion. And the cops. And the cops. The cops thought he, it was him the whole time. In, in, a, in a small, they just didn't have enough to go on because he p- passed the polygraph and because he had an alibi. And I guess there's always a chance that the alibi could be faked and... We all know that psychopaths can occasionally pass a polygraph test. You know, so there you go. There's your doubt. Yeah, a psychopath would be good at that, right? Because they don't feel all that guilt and they don't get nervous and all the things that set off a polygraph. Um, so he. So this guy's life. This guy's life was ruined. He lost his wife, mm-hmm. and he's accused of this heinous crime. Yeah. One thing that did clear him initially, because because the DNA hadn't evolved to the to the point, and I'm not completely schooled on this, but. What I was that they could tell that the blood type, not the DNA, but the blood type was not his type. They at least had that initially, which which further ruled him out in the in the cops' eyes. But the DNA, when it came to be, um, really, you know, a strong a strong form of evidence to be able to uh, to use, uh, they were able to tell that it wasn't his DNA. So um, it'll take until 2018, and the popular use of genetic genealogy for investigators to begin to hone in on the true killer. It comes down to a Breckenridge residence, resident, a former miner who would have been 30 in 1982 and in the area. His name is Alan Lee Phillips. And at this point, he's in his late 60s. He's the owner of a mechanic shop. And investigators have been looking at his brothers and uh, nieces and stuff because the way that they get a, a hit on this is if one of them have applied to find out their genealogy through one of these sites. We all know how it works with the Golden State Killer. That's how they got him. And they find that Alan Lee Phillips lives in the fucking town where these two women were murdered. So they obviously are going to look at Alan Lee Phillips. Well, they approached his brother first and his brother said, no, he, he, he hasn't lived there. But I got a, 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 a strange brother who lives there who is Alan Lee Phillips. You got it. And investigators, they start staking him out. He's a bit of a hermit living in this uh, this hovel. They're desperate to get a sample of his DNA. Sorry, I shouldn't say hovel. He did have money. It was just, you know, he's a hermit. Um, he actually got married, had three kids, has a couple, a couple of stepkids, but I believe he's single at this point and kind of living alone. They stake at his home, waiting on garbage day for him to bring out some trash. And week after week, dead bug, on garbage day, he doesn't emerge from the house with the garbage. Where the fuck is this guy putting his garbage? He doesn't put his garbage out, dead bug. They they think he's possibly burning it, which is a little suspicious. A definite reason for concern. (laughs) And it'll take a while for investigators to get a break. They finally end up following him to a Sonic restaurant. A little puke and go. They're like, okay, he's eating in there. He comes out with the bag. And they follow him to the post office. And then they see him bring the bag into the post office. But when he emerges from the post office, he only has his mail and not the bag. So the officers go into the post office and they find his trash bag from Sonic. And they retrieve a napkin from the bag that he wiped his face with. Bingo, you got your saliva. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the match that they make is one in a trillion that it's not him. It's absolutely him. Uh, they make the arrest uh, weeks later, as long as it takes to, to make the match. And the old man at this point, he's shocked to be put in cuffs. They say his mouth is just hanging open. He's not saying anything. He's just he, in complete shock. I'm assuming that he'd heard about the Golden State Killer thing or just about the genie. That's why he's not putting it in his garbage, right? This guy is one cagey son of a bitch, Jack. And like you said, when you see the picture of him getting arrested, he never saw it. He never saw it coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so he's dead to rights with the DNA evidence. Alan Lee Phillips denies the charges. It soon found he'd been accused of picking a girl up when he was in his early 20s, taking her to an abandoned cabin, 
raping her, beating or attempting to rape her, beating the girl over the head with a rock, trying to kill her before deciding to let her go when she begged him enough. And he ended up serving six months in prison for that violent attack back when he was in his early 20s. There you go. So there you go. With his history of violence, right? He's their man in the DNA evidence, obviously. So there's no doubt about it. He's been living under their noses this entire time. He's a friend of every many in the community because of his mechanic business, although he is a hermit because he doesn't want to get too close to anybody because he has this hanging over his head, I assume. So Phillips is arrested in February of 2021, and it's then that they realize they had him. They'd actually had him the night of the murders, and nobody put it together. That night, dead bug, January 6th of 82, Alan Phillips had become stuck while driving his pickup through a j- dangerous pass in the mountains nearby the two murder scenes. And this is unbelievable. He was drunk and attempting to avoid detection when the blizzard caused him to slide backwards into a ditch. Phillips, he tried to walk. This is like around midnight. He tried to walk away from his vehicle, but it was too cold for him to get anywhere where he can get help. And he realized he's probably going to die out there. It's so cold. It's getting shut down by the blizzard. Or at the very least, have a very uncomfortable night. And he returns to his truck. He's drunk. Very drunk. Uh, worn out from murdering two young women. Because <laughs> we know that that's what he had just done now. And he's stuck as a result of wanting to keep a low profile after these murders. <sighs> Everything I discussed about Jeff Oberholzer the hypothesis of how he killed these girls and what is initially thought to have been Jeff's wild night of murder, this man, Alan Phillips, has actually just completed. So, he'd first stolen Annette Schnee around 4.30 p.m., just as the clouds were rolling in. Annette Schnee, whom he rapes at gunpoint in the woods before ordering her to get dressed, maybe he was going to go and let her go, dead bug. Why get her to dress again? You know, he let the first girl go. I think he probably had second thoughts when he let her go and decided to shoot her down by the creek as she tried to get away. Mm, fuck. We already discussed how they both froze after being shot. They didn't initially die from their wounds. And then, apparently, hungry for more, he heads back into town to find another girl. Jesus Christ. I mean, what are the odds that you find two girls as good looking? In the fuck ass right. middle of nowhere. I mean, we're in the fuck ass Both middle hitchhiking. of nowhere. And these girls could be, they could be models. Both with their thumb out. Mm-hmm. Both with their thumb out, and both, they think, probably were familiar with him. He was known in town, so. Maybe the trust, and that's Bobby where the Joe. trust level goes. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's a known guy. Well, he's 30 years old at that time, but he would have been around the bars. Annette was a barkeeper, like she was a. Cocktail waitress, and it's not that he knew both of them. They were familiar with them. So, and also, I heard it said that he likely had picked them up before. He was one of the guys who would pick up the girls when he was coming through town. It was just like everybody helped everybody out when it came to the hitchhiking, especially young, good-looking blondes who are just trying to get home after work. So, Bobby Joe was picked up around 7.30 p.m. as the weather was getting really bad. She was trying to get home to her husband, Jeff, before it was too late and she had to hunker down with friends, as he assumed initially that she had done. And when Alan Phillips brought her out to Hoosier Pass and put a gun in her face, slapped a zip tie on one wrist, meaning to disable her so he could rape her by a mountain face under the cover of darkness and the enveloping blizzard, she'd fought him, dead bug. The thought is that she got the best of Phillips, hitting him hard with the brass ring Jeff had given Bobby Joe for such an occasion. Wow. Wow. And this is a sturdy girl. I mean, this looks like a sturdy girl. She's a good-looking girl, but she looks healthy, a healthy country girl that uh, can probably give if she needs to. And she to. did. The, I'll get to it in a second. Like, So Phillips being drunk and surprised by the supercharged punch to the forehead by this basically a brass knuckle, he takes the gun off of her. Because he's grabbing for his head and shit. He's like, what the fuck? He's got a big gash over his right eyebrow. She cut him open. And when Bobby Joe had tried to run, she gets out of the passenger side, he'd recovered and shot her dead. Then gone driving around, tossing her belongings at the window. And that's when the rancher found it and all that kind of stuff later on. That's that's what they believe happened. Jeez. 
So, so he never confessed to any of this. This is just what the investigators yes. believed happened. He never admitted to it. But we need to come back to him being stuck in that snow drift that night. So after trying to covertly get back home after a wild Wednesday night, it's a Wednesday, by the way, uh, through a particularly harrowing section called Guanella Pass, where nobody in their right mind would be driving in a storm, it's around midnight when a passenger plane flies over him stuck and destitute and worried for his life. And Alan Phillips begins flashing his headlights, SOS. That's three short, three long, three short flashes of his headlights. And this passenger jet is going overhead with a hundred odd people on it when this is all happening. Yes. And so initially I thought it was like a Cessna or something like that, right? But from what I read further, is it's an actual passenger plane. It doesn't have a shitload of people on it, but can hold like a hundred people on it. This is starting to get a bit crazy. Uh, like I mentioned, the back end of his truck had got stuck, which left his headlights pointed skyward. And incredibly, a local sheriff's deputy from the from the area is on the flight above looking at his window and sees the distress signal down below. <laughs> and he tells the pilot, and the pilot radios it in, which is unbelievable luck for Phillips down there as he was eventually going to freeze. Like, he's stuck in the middle of a mountain pass in, the, in this blizzard, and he likely would have been deserted for a while. The temperatures are frigid. Well, it's, it's Jack, it's, it's about 35 below with wind chill factor. That's pretty fucking cold. That's pretty cold. You're not going to live that, that long in it. No. But so lucky that his vehicle went ass end so that his lights were pointed skyward for the SOS to work in the direction. And, and I'm unbelievably lucky that you have a sheriff's deputy who knows what SOS is and what are the was odds? looking at the window. What are the odds? That's insane. So, um, even luckier, when the fire department comes out to rescue him, they don't put it together. Later, when they hear about the two other girls being murdered, they just think that Alan Phillips, with a gash on his head when they find him, they just think he was hammered out by these two murder scenes by chance. Um, and they just laughed it off with, with the killer who claimed to have hit his head on his truck while drunkenly taking a piss. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and the snow hit him in the face and he fell and he hit his head on his truck. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is... Uh, and and th- you, you'd wish this guy would have fucking frozen to yeah. death. Yeah. Someone comments on that a little bit later. So I'll, I'm starting to wrap it up here. But the, the truth, as we know, dead bug, was that he'd been struck by the brass ring of Bobby Joe's. Blood found on that brass ring and on her glove later would be would be part of the DNA evidence that would bring him down. A Colorado newspaper article from January of 82 has the story of Bobby, of Bobby Joe Oberholzer's body being found and the story of her killer's miraculous SOS rescue side by side in the newspaper. Jesus. The story is right there. Jesus. Like literally connected by print, dead bug. They're, they're right beside these two articles, Fuck. but it'll take 40 years for them to fucking connect it. Uh, they even have a photo of Alan Phillips for the paper in this article. So you have the Bobby Joe missing. Where is she? There's her killer in the article doing the SOS signal. Like, hello, I'm the one who did it. That is insane. It's insane that this prick was able to continue living. Yeah, 40 years. So like we know, he gets arrested, the DNA, and all that shit. In 2021, uh, Philip wants the case to go to trial. He hires a a pretty expensive defense lawyer and they try to blame old Jeff Oberholzer, like the poor guy hasn't been through enough, the husband of Bobby Joe. Yeah. They claim uh, that he, they claim that he killed his wife because she brought home cold pizza the night before. Something, something that Jeff in his detrimental honesty had shared while being interrogated. They're like, have you ever get any fights? Well, last night we had a fight. She brought home cold pizza. I was pretty pissed about it. (laughs) And they think this is the reason. Why. Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I can see the point of view. I mean, no one likes uh, cold pizza, but uh, I mean, to kill over it. I mean, come on, Jack. Right. Come on. And the other girl, too. Yeah. Uh, he'd also sh- he'd also shared while being interrogated, you know, the psychic musings on where Annette Schnell would be found. Sh- Shell. I know a girl named Schnell. I keep saying Schnell. Shell had been found. And um, but when they put the blood on. Bobby Joe's glove um, as a result of her bopping Phillips in the forehead causing a gash when they put that blood in the DNA match to Phillips bingo in front of the jury yeah and they said that it's one in 17 quadrillion 
which is two and a quarter million times Earth's population, wouldn't have been able to water down that result to anybody else other than him. So, ballistics, you know, they, they, they match the bullets, the orange sock, tie Annette Schnell to the Bobby Joe case. He's dead to rights. He shows no emotion in court. But unfortunately, after being convicted and sentenced to two life sentences, Alan Lee Phillips dies at 72, just recently in prison. I, and I say that it's unfortunate because it's believed he could have been a serial killer and responsible for more murders. And there was hope they could get some confessions out of him. Without a doubt, I mean, because, I mean, he's just killed. Now, now where do we stand? For me, it seemed very um, clear on this. I mean, did he, uh, did he uh, fuck both, both the girls? Okay. He did rape Annette Shell because um, her clothing was put back yeah, on after yeah. the rape. He wasn't, he wanted to rape Bobby Joe, but Bobby Joe fought him off before he could get the zip tie attached to her other wrist. And she punched him in the head with the brass ring and tried to escape out the vehicle. Which is a real boner killer if you get punched by a brass knuckle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it puts me out of the mood. Right, yeah. Anytime it's happened to me, it's done the same. I mean, I try, but it's difficult. So they uh, still have his DNA, and the investigation continues, Deadbug, but we'll see what more we learn in this fascinating case as time goes on. Uh, this guy's definitely a serial killer. I mean, you just don't just don't suddenly get up out of bed and kill two women in one night and then quit. No, no, I, don't, I, I agree. There's a quote from Alan Lee Phillips we have from his first known victim, the one who survived when he was in his early 20s. Yeah. She remembered uh, him saying as he tried to kill her with a rock, quote, I don't know. I don't know why I do this, end quote. I say that very same thing every time I piss on the toilet seat, Jack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I do this. It's the same as when you wear, you get that little pee drip when you come out of the bathroom in the office and everybody sees it. <laughs> yeah. No matter how many times I shake it, Jack, there's still that little wet spot. <laughs> Oh, dabbing at your stuff uh, with your pomp. Oh, stop, stop messing with your 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 roller skating story. So yeah, cut me some slack, Jack. <laughs> I you know I opened up to you, and uh, you, you, now you're just throwing it back in my face at every opportunity. <sighs> Do you need a tissue, Jack? Yeah, that's how we show we care about each other. I think at this point, then, but... yeah, yeah, I think you may be right. So at this point, Jack. We don't know if this guy's a serial killer or not, but him saying, I don't know why I do this, I mean, it's it's kind of a giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, one more quote. This is from Dave Montoya, the fire chief at the time, who helped rescue Alan Phillips. Uh, he, he would later say, quote, had I known, I would have left him there. He And then he continues with some of our, our own thoughts that we've said here so far, again, furthering the quote. He goes, who has luck like that. I mean, really, you commit two murders, you get stuck up at the top of a pass trying to flee the scene and everything else, and you get stuck where you know you're probably going to die and you ask for mercy from God and you get it? End quote. If you were to write this into a movie that a guy murders two girls, he gets stuck in the snow, ass up, he flashes his SOS signal to a plane, and there happens to be a cop inside that plane who knows how to read SOS... I mean, they, they tell you you were joking, that it was unbelievable. Yeah, I was having trouble believing it myself. I, when I found out the, the detail of him going in backwards, that made sense to me, but it's just like the incredible luck of it for him. Yeah, it should be made into a movie. I'm sure it will be at some point. You'll probably see it on Netflix next week, the way they gobble this shit up. I can picture it now, a TV movie of the week starring Billy Bob Thornton and Britney Spears. And what a great story, Jack. Thanks, man. This was great, too. Like, uh, I had a quote from you here. A uh, quote from Deadbug on this. Sometimes this life leads me to despair. God, I'm good. And that's <laughs> that's how you feel about that. For 40 years, he gets away from away with it and maybe kills others, too, that we're not aware of. Well, Jack, it's pretty safe to say that this guy has done it before because uh, these were good-looking girls. And you know what they say. Once, once you get the hunger, you got to feed, Jack. You got to feed. I, yeah, I agree. Well, Jack, on that note, I think it's time that we say adios. We'll see everybody next time on Tales 
from the bottom down. Till death do us part. Till death, till death. Till death do us part. Until death, until death. I do take you. To hold and to have through dark and through bad Till my heart doesn't move, I choose you And I, I, I do take you For better and worse, I'll accept your thirst Through smiles and through gunshot wounds I'm the wife of a bad man I'm the lover of the damned Sleep tight with the killer at night Every night despite a kiss a killer good night I'm the wife of a bad man, I'm the lover of the damned Sleep tight with a killer at night, every night I kiss a killer good night. I do take you Through sickness and health, through dirty cash wealth Through the broke and the bruised I take you Every night I don't sleep, every secret you keep I solemnly vow to stand by you I'm the wife of a bad man I'm the lover of the damned Sleep tight with a killer at night Every night despite a kiss a killer good night I'm the wife of a bad man I'm the lover of the damned Sleep tight with a killer at night Every night despite a kiss a killer good night Just me, or is there anybody else here tearing up? <laughs> Why does a man have to be so strong? <laughs> 